Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Mo. This talk is called JavaScript for Cyborgs, and you'll find out why in a moment. Um, so I decided to call this talk JavaScript for Cyborgs because I consider myself a cyborg. I have a, uh, an NFC chip implanted into my left hand between the thumb and the forefinger. Uh, I'm considering implanting magnets into my fingertip tips with the scalpel. Not sure whether I want to do that yet. Maybe you guys can help me decide. Uh, and I'm um, also someone who considers biohacking and uh, grinding, as it's called, the new forefront in human evolution. <laughs> OK, so what, what does this all mean? Um, this little thing on the lower left corner of the screen is the chip. It's actually 12 millimeters by 2 millimeters wide. I blend it up there. The thing on the right is my hand, and this is the little packet it came in. So uh, the NFC chip, I bought it from something called Dangerous Things. Uh, it arrived in a customs marked um, <laughs> box saying, this, this package, package must not contain any dangerous items. Uh, the branding somewhat sort of offset that. Uh, so uh, th this is where it gets a little bit more gory. Um, it came in a 10G syringe, um, and that was inserted into my hand. I'm going to show you the uh, short sort of uh, animation of the procedure here. Uh, anyone who's fainted should be taken out. Great, OK. so. Uh, what is a cyborg and what am I talking about? Uh, cyborgs are people who are biohackers, people who have implanted things into their body, but there are also people who have pacemakers, people who have bionic limbs or have augmented their body or uh, improved their body in a way that involves meshing with technology in some way. So I have a kind of two-part definition of what a cyborg is, and I'm going to give you the first part now and the second part later. The first part is... A cyborg is someone who has augmented their body's capabilities using technology. Um, so I like to say that someone's become a machine and mensch, uh, if you understood my German. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cyborgs are, uh, have, are not a new thing. People have been augmenting their bodies with technology for centuries, perhaps millennia. But the internet and wireless communication has enabled a new uh, acceleration in the capabilities of the human body. I can effectively, though not directly, connect myself to the internet using this technology, and we're going to show you how later. In fact, uh, this, small, this talk has a small interactive component, so if any of you have a laptop and you know how to make an HTTP POST request, then you may want to have uh, your uh, curl or your Postman client open just in case you want to participate in the demo in a bit. So um, I don't have my speaker notes for this, but luckily it's on the screen. Uh, so I mean, I like this quote from Sadie Plant's Zeros and Ones, which is a book about cyborgs written a few years ago, because it really talks about how the future is going to involve people who uh, already accept that we are enmeshed with technology and that technology is something that uh, has already taken control of our lives and something that we should take control of in a more direct way as well. So this talk is kind of my preliminary research into an area which uh, I've seen in scattered corners of the internet but haven't really seen brought together. And it's an idea of an API for the human body itself. Uh, it's also about how we can use JavaScript, because that's what this conference is about, to interact physically with something that is inside my body. Um, JavaScript has been used to interact with Internet of Things and Arduino uh, hardware for a few years. You, you may be familiar with Johnny Five um, if you came to the roundtable discussion yesterday. Uh, but I think this is something a little bit new. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction to what NFC is. So NFC is the technology which is involved in the little one centimeter uh, pill in my hand. It stands for near field communication. So it's radio communication. It uses radio waves at 13.56 megahertz. The range is very small. It's one to four centimeters. So um, in the UK, we have these things called oyster cards, which are, you use to touch on the reader when you're trying to get on the tube. And they're heralded as a contactless form of uh, payment. In effect, uh, you can just hover your card one centimeter above the reader, 
and it will register it as a read. In reality, sometimes you have to touch it on the reader, and later when you see me use this device to connect to the hand, um, you'll notice that I have to bring it quite close. Uh, this may assuage some of the security concerns when it comes to actually uh, storing data on this thing, but um, in effect, I don't think it's really a secure medium, but I'm going to go into that a bit later. Uh, so the tags are passive. This is really important because it means I don't have to put a battery inside my body. People have, done, people have made devices which involve LEDs and vibrations and things like that. Uh, sometimes these have to be powered by batteries that are only going to last a few years. Uh, while I deeply respect these people and what they're doing, I wanted to have something that was going to be, if not permanent, maybe something that was going to not have uh, the kind of obsolescence that we're used to with technology, uh, like a laptop that will expire after three years. I, I expect this will last, hopefully, a little bit longer than that. They have hard-coded, unique IDs, and there are these things called NDEF records. So each tag, when it's manufactured, is given uh, a unique ID which can't be changed by the user. Um, that's the intention. In reality, sometimes you can clone tags, you can get uh, dodgy chips from China which are able to uh, change their unique IDs. Uh, the manufacturers of NFC chips tend to um, counter this by signing them cryptographically or using other forms of sort of uh, higher level security. Uh, NDEF records are the um, NFC data exchange formats. So what that means is that when you store the data on this thing, you need to have some sort of way of uh, agreeing on how you're going to read and write the data. The data is stored on the um, chip, but unless you know how you've encoded it, then you don't really have much hope of being able to understand it. So I'm going to go into NDEF records later because they're the kind of universally agreed standard for how you should store multiple bits of data on one uh, NFC tag. So the uses of NFC. Um, I've already described to you Oyster cards in London. Uh, we Contactless payment is another one, so uh, I'm not sure if you have this in Germany, but you can have a credit card which um, you just tap on the reader to pay for anything under £30. I see you nodding, that's, that, that's great, because uh, it's a really great technology. I mean, it's kind of great until you discover that people have been sneaking up to other people on the tube and using a card reader to kind of quickly skim £20 from each person. Uh, so this is one reason why I, I didn't go down the avenue of actually storing money on this. There is a guy who has, um, I believe, made a Bitcoin payment with the uh, chip in his hand. Uh, the chip probably stores the private key and is used as an extra authorization step in a Bitcoin flow involving a separate app. The important thing to note here, I guess, is that the chip can't perform any processing. It's merely a passive data storage medium. Great, OK. so. Um, Let's get a bit more practical. This is the PN532 breakout board, which I bought from Adafruit. Uh, it's actually this big, um, so those of you at the back may have some difficulty seeing a bit of the demo, but the code will be on the screen, so it should make sense. What this is, is it's an NFC antenna, so it can read and write, and I think also emulate NFC tags. NFC tags have three, well, NFC devices have three modes. Uh, the reader-writer mode, like this. This is the fully capable device. This is able to, this is powered and it's able to issue um, effectively commands and uh, send data over the wire. There are the passive tags, like the one in my hand, uh, and there are uh, emulation modes. So this could pretend to be a passive tag. That's not as interesting, I guess. Uh, great. OK, so um, I want to talk about the demo that I'm going to do today. Uh, I have a couple of things that I've been doing as part of my research. Uh, so one of them is uh, the demo I'm going to show you. So the difficult thing about uh, reading NFC on a device like a laptop is that you don't really have, there's no native NFC antenna in this thing. I don't know of any laptops that really have one. So um, I had to connect this PN532 to the laptop. So it doesn't look too bad. I mean, there's, it's just a USB cable, but um, the actual form of communication used is, is over an FDTI cable, which uses serial. So um, the computer has to have a serial driver in order to use that. And doing that in JavaScript, whether or not that was a wise idea, I guess you can judge for yourselves, um, will 
require some special libraries and uh, will require a little bit of uh, fiddling around, um, which I'm going to show you the results of, at least maybe not the whole journey, because that would take too long. OK, so uh, JavaScript, I'm going to show you the little ecosystem I've used to build out some of my demos. Not all of them are in the demo that we're going to see right now. Uh, but yeah, so I just thought I'd show you my stack. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of these are fake, but um, uh, this is modern JavaScript. OK, right, like, okay let's go to JavaScript. OK. Uh, right. OK, I'm going to um, resize this until it's about right. Can anyone not see that? OK, great. Um, so I've just got the kind of shell of what we're doing here. Um, OK, let's start live coding. So the aim of this demo, uh, this first part of the demo, is to read from the NFC chip in my hand using some code in JavaScript running on the computer. That's the kind of parameters of what we're doing here. Uh, so uh, we're in Node at the moment, uh, so let's go and require some libraries. That's the first thing we want to do. So. Uh, the first thing we're going to grab is this serial port constructor from um, a library called Node Serial Port. This is incredibly useful because, um, as you can see, that was easy to require. And um, now we have all the capabilities of the low-level drivers that we need uh, in order to communicate over this FDTI cable with the PN532, which, as you recall, was the board I got from Adafruit. There's another library we're going to use. I'm going to grab the constructor from that, which is the one for this particular board. So uh, PN532 also has a node library, uh, kindly written by someone doing something similar to me there without the biohacking um, component. And finally, we're going to use an NDEF library. So if you remember from before, NDEF is the data format that we encode the things on the NFC tag in. Uh, this is just simple sort of buffer to string conversion, um, along with a lot of uh, futzing around with arrays. So hopefully, uh, that'll work fine, and we won't have to delve deeper into the NDEF format uh, at the kind of byte level. Cool. So uh, these two lines here that I've pre-written um, are the address of the device as um, uh, as it is seen by my machine. So if I go to, uh, in fact, let's do this. I'm not sure if you can see this. Ah, sorry. Well, if, if, if I write, if I ls my dev, uh, these are all my dev devices. You might not be able to see that. But what we've got there is one that you probably won't see on your device, which is this USB serial um, with a serial number there. That's what I got to put into this constant here. The board rate, um, uh, if you've done a bit of electronics, you'll know what that is. If not, it's basically the kind of rate of symbols traveling across the wire. Uh, it's just a constant that we have to set in order to correctly listen to the signals coming from the serial port. Great. So um, let's uh, initialize our, the object that is going to give us um, access to the PN532. Excuse me, I mean this. Uh, OK, so all we need to do is give it the device and the board rate. Um, now we've got the serial port and the PN532 library, really easy to use. Uh, we now, all we have to do is wrap the serial port in that. OK, so let, let, let's just do something that actually uh, runs the code. OK, so. We use um, this kind of event handler-like API in order to uh, establish that the board is ready. So the first thing we need to do is to check it's connected to the computer. So, excellent, nothing is happening. <laughs> I like to think of live coding more as sort of, a, yeah, um, you're right. I like to think of live coding more as sort of high stakes pair programming. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, great. OK, so now it says ready. OK. Um, so what we've established is that this thing with the big red light on it is actually connected to the computer. Um, what we established before that wasn't that nothing was happening, but that, was that there were no errors. OK, cool. So now what we want to do is detect a tag. So uh, here are a couple I made earlier. Um, they're not actually 
uh, in my hand, and I want to show you that I've got different tags with different IDs on them. This is the first thing to establish, because if they all have the same ID, then there's no way we can identify my, me by the tag that's in, particularly in my hand. So when it detects a tag, we, have, we get this tag object. And what we're going to do with that is we're just going to log it to see what it looks like. Uh, OK. So um, the board is ready. Uh, I'm going to scan it on my hand. Great. So we've got an object. Uh, this is not a particularly pretty object, uh, but it, the important thing to see is the UID here. So um, this is the unique ID of the tag that is inside my hand. What I hope is that there's no other tag in the world that has this ID, at least not one made by the same manufacturer. Uh, and if there is, then um, my two-factor authentication demo probably won't work, but I'll show you that in a minute. OK, great. So uh, now we've got the tag. What we want to do now is read the data off it. Uh, and so it could be this easy. Uh, so what we want to do now is read the endf data. Um, I mean, the endf library and the uh, serial port and PN532 libraries are great. Uh, there's a kind of mix of API styles. So we've got a promise going on. Um, and uh, just pass it this and imagine we're using uh, callbacks. OK. so. Let's have a look at the data on this thing. So what data is actually on the hand? Um, sorry, I don't know why I have to keep zooming in. Great, so we've got a load of data. Um, this is really uh, a buffer representation, which if you've done a bit of Node um, or anything at a slightly lower level, you'll recognize as uh, something that uh, is not as easy to read as something that isn't encoded. So let's try to decode this thing. Um, so what we need to do is use the endf library. This is the function of the endf library. So this is the buffer that's on the device, um, and now we need to try to decode it according to the rules defined in the endf specification, uh, which all sounds very complicated, but uh, thankfully we've got the library to do it for us. So let's decode the message. Um, we need to sort of um, fuss around a bit with this. That's just the format expects the data in. Uh, So let's actually log that now. Great. OK. Um, we have something that says JavaScript for cyborgs, but we also have a load of other stuff. Um, we have a TNF, a type, ID, payload, all this stuff. Um, there are actually two records on this chip. So um, on the chip in the hand, there are these two um, objects in the array. It's rather hard to see. Um, and uh, each of them contains this payload of uh, bytes and um, the actual value of the record. So NDEF records can be of various different types. You can have a URL record, a text record, a contact record, all sorts of, sorts of things. It leads to really cool applications, like having to being able to have your business card on your hand. Uh, the first guy I met with one of these, I tapped my Android phone on his hand, and his contact info just came up. And I thought that was such magic that I wanted to get my own one. Uh, I never realized it would lead me to this JavaScript journey, but uh, here we go. OK, so um, what I'm going to do finally is just um, map that so that we can just see the value of the data. We don't need to see the payload. We don't need to see the TNF, um, the type, all that kind of thing. Um, the demo I want to show you today is just that we can write to the chip um, and read from the chip. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, read from the chip. OK, so uh, this yeah, message is fine. Um, so actually, what we want is, forgive my JavaScript variable naming. Uh, no, we don't want that. Okay. Uh, OK, so we just want to see the um, value of each one, and that's what it's called, right? Great. Let's just check that. Yeah, great. OK, so now we've got an array with two um, objects and in it with just two values. OK, so we can read from the tag. We can read from the data that's in my hand. Um, there's not very interesting data in there at the moment. All it is is a URL and a value. If you tapped your phone on this, the URL would come up. So my website would come up in your phone, and the browser would immediately try to load it with no uh, permissions or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's an awesome way of bypassing the control people think they have over their phone. Uh, OK, cool. So now let's move to um, the right demo. OK, uh, I've got another demo here. 
And um, what I want to show you now is that we can write data to the tag. So this is where I want you to have your curl client or your Postman client ready, because um, what we're going to do is you're going to curl or post to an endpoint, and it's going to end up inside the hand. So whatever you post, uh, hopefully I've sanitized it enough that you can't actually break anything, uh, but we'll see, uh, will end up inside the hand. Um, it's, actually, it's kind of last come first serve, so the last person to post to that endpoint will end up with the uh, data inside my hand, and then everyone can read it later. So uh, it's a kind of reverse race. Um, I'm going to just put the URL at the top of the screen here. So uh, you want to post to. So just post a raw message body to that. Uh, it doesn't need JSON or anything. If you do it JSON, it'll be stringified anyway. Uh, so if you send a post request to there, then um, we'll see what's on there in a, in a bit. But let's get on with the demo while you're doing that. Cool, so I've required a lot more libraries here. Um, I didn't feel the need to write this out again while live coding. So uh, all we've got that's different from last time is that we've got the request library. We're going to use this to make a request to this, which when I make a get request to it, I've set the server. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I set the server to um, uh, just repeat to me what was last sent to that endpoint, just uh, kind of echoing it. Great, so as before, we've got these event handlers. So uh, when the uh, PN532 is ready, it will log PN532 ready, and on tag, it will uh, log the tag with the UID. So uh, let's just check that this works. PN532 is ready, sorry. Tag detected with UID, great. So I'm just going to prove to you that uh, this isn't a fake demo. Um, we've got a different tag there, it's got a different ID, and another one. So um, the end tag 216 is just the exact tag that is. Uh, the type of tag that is in my hand. Great, so um, I'm not going to put in the stuff about the endpoint yet. Let's um, just get it in with uh, encoding all the data that we need to do. Okay, great, so um, let's just call it message to write. Uh, great, so we're going to try to write this data onto the tag. Um, so what we could do is we could just say, uh, uh, so we could attempt to um, send the data to the tag um, like this, and we could say, that's probably not going to work. Um, and it's, in fact, it's definitely not going to work because we haven't actually encoded the data into the right format. So um, let's actually define a message array uh, where the first member is uh, a URL record, and I'm doing this so that when someone actually um, scans my hand with their phone, it comes up with that URL, which I think is cool, uh, rather than just coming up with the text. Oh, URI record, great. Um, right. And the final record, the last record, will be uh, the message that we want to write. So it'll be a text record. So as you can see, we've got these types defined in here already. Um, these just correspond to the types in the end of spec. Great, so uh, uh, what we need to do is actually encode these messages into the right format. So uh, that's as easy as endf.encode message. Uh, and then we want to call this. And now we want to write the encoded messages to the tag. So um, I've learned. Uh, while developing in this way, that um, the best way to test these things out is probably not on the chip inside my hand. Um, I'm slightly worried occasionally about um, bricking it somehow or finding some way to write corrupt data onto it. Uh, while I can't find any, any way of doing that, uh, I don't particularly trust my own uh, node skills, so we're just going to write this data to this tag. Cool. Um, what I've forgotten to do, uh, as this is live coding, is actually get some sort of verification that we've written the data. So again, this is a promise-based API, um, and there's a response, but it's usually undefined. So let's just assume it's going to be fine in true JavaScript error handling style. <laughs> Great. The write was successful. So what we can do is we can check. Um, uh, using the read script if we don't actually trust that we've um, written it on properly. So let's just quickly run the script. Great. So the value is hello enter JS. 
um, because we haven't actually requested it from the endpoint yet. Uh, great. Okay, so I'm going to go on to uh, the right code. Okay. Um, so we're almost at the end of this demo, and um, the final thing I want to do is just see if anyone's posted to this endpoint um, and see what kind of data that ends up on my hand. I'm quite excited to see what kind of things put, people have put on there. Um, hello is sufficient. Okay, so um, the message we actually want to write uh, comes from that endpoint, and we just need to send a get request, which is easy with request. Uh, and it's just, yeah. So we make a get request to that. Um, uh, there's a load of parameters and a body. Uh, um, so actually what we want... Okay, the body is the most important thing here, which is why I don't think the other par parameters need to be logged. So we can log what's in the body, um, but what I want to do is actually set it to be the message to write to the tag. So uh, let's stick all this code in here. Um, and actually set the message to write to be the body, by which I mean that. Um, it's not long the body. Okay, so now what we've got is we've got um, a request going up off to an endpoint um, somewhere on the internet. We're going to get some data from the internet, we're going to grab it, and we're going to run some JavaScript uh, through the, the, the drivers and everything to get it into the hand. Um, so I think the implications of this are quite interesting because uh, for example, uh, there's a number which is illegal to um, uh, store. Well, I don't think it's illegal to store, but it's illegal uh, to share this number because it was used in DVD encodings in the 90s. I want to know what the implications would be, legally or otherwise, of putting that number inside my hand, smuggling it into the US, smuggling it into any sort of facility uh, which would just involve me walking into the facility. Um, I think this is really interesting. So if someone's put something illegal on there, then um, we're going to find out maybe very soon what the implications of that would be. Uh, but let's just see what it is. So uh, we're going to write this data to a tag. That seems successful. We're going to write the data to my hand. OK, the write was successful. Let's see what it is. So um, we finished writing the data. Let's go and read some data. JavaScript, excellent post request, thank you. <laughs> Great, so I'll, I'll, I'll probably um, uh, monitor this throughout the day and see what else happens. Okay, great, um, so I'm gonna go back to my presentation now as I'm uh, probably running out of time. Uh, so, and I still don't have any speaker notes. Uh, yeah. Hey, I haven't finished. <laughs> so, um, Thank you. I have another demo here. Uh, it's not a live coding demo, so it won't take as long. Um, but I'm just going to really rush through it because I have five minutes left of this presentation. So um, two-factor authentication is something, is a method of authentication where instead of the user just entering a password, um, they enter a password plus they do something else, like they enter a code that you've got on your phone, or they enter a code that was sent to them in some other way, or they respond to a push notification. Um, what if the second factor in this two-factor authentication flow uh, were the ID of the chip in my hand. So I built this demo. Um, basically, uh, don't curl this endpoint yet because I'm, I'm not monitoring the, uh, it. Um, you scan the tag, and then um, it'll receive a reply as to whether or not the person who scanned the tag was me. And the way it tells is just by the ID of the chip. So this suffers from all the things we had before. I mean, I made a web sequence diagram, but um, other people's web sequence diagrams are I mean, hell is other people's websites, even these diagrams, really. So uh, the future I want to see in this kind of research. Um, so this, as I say, is just the beginning of the research I'm doing into this area. Uh, there are a number of open questions which I think we should all think about, uh, whether or not we decide to become cyborgs ourselves. So um, you may have noticed in the two-factor authentication demo and the other demo, indeed, that these are all particular to me, unless you've also got a chip in your hand with exactly the same specifications and... Um, uh, or, or at least, you know, that obeys the same specifications, uh, you can't participate in this. I think it's interesting and a, a reflection of the wider sort of Internet of Things uh, situation that we have um, what's essentially walled gardens and um, a way of uh, stopping div devices from communicating with other devices over the Internet, which was uh, indeed the idea to begin with. So um, I'm going to skip the rest of this. Uh, another interesting uh, 
implication here is that I now have something in my hand, uh, apart from my fingerprints, which is uniquely identifies me. So if I go somewhere, then I'm going to find that the, uh, and, and someone scans the tag, then someone knows I've been there. Whether or not this is important to me, um, it's, it may be some sort of privacy concern, but what I think is interesting is that the chip is no re not really any more identifiable than my fingerprints, and not really any more likely to be left at a location. So, um, as I say, the read range of the chip is less than four centimeters. So, what happens is uh, someone shakes my hand or something, they scan the chip, uh, they get the data off it. You can encrypt the data on, on it with a 32-bit password, but unfortunately it's... Uh, oh, I think those are my speaker notes. Thank you. <laughs> um, the final thing I want to say... Thank you. I actually... Uh, yeah. Thank you. No, that, that's, that's fine. I really uh, appreciate that. Um, because, I, because I have a really good example from this last slide. Um, as you can see, I, I had a lot to say. Uh, so, I was, yeah, so I was at the Tate Modern the other day, and I met an artist called Chloe Spicer. So what she does is she explores the possibilities of embodied data. Uh, she focuses on books. Um, books are her focus as a librarian. So uh, she wears books. She consumes books. She eats books. She wants to become data embodied in a book. Um, and I thought this was really interesting and kind of relevant for me as well. Uh, so uh, you may say that 888 bytes of data isn't a lot. Maybe the human brain can store terabytes of data, though in a slightly different uh, format than a computer. Um, DNA can encode data, but like, th like thoughts, I can't directly access them. Um, I can't have the same thought twice, and I can't access the data encoded in my DNA. So to have a persistent a uh, data storage device in my hand, which can store an exact amount of data and will do so for the foreseeable future, is, I think, a capability that my body didn't have before. And that's what's interesting about this. Um, I think, although it's a small step, it's a step towards augmenting our bodies and uh, transcending uh, our previously human limitations. Thank you.